Oye, mi gente, it's June, and that means the start of summer. La playa, vacation. And it's also National Dairy Month. Makes sense. Ice cream, milkshakes, cheese on your burger and the barbecue. Okay, I'm about to start drooling all over this microphone. <laughs> no, claro that you're drooling. Pretty much all those summer favorites are made with real Florida dairy products. Okay, so that means they're not only delicious, but also nutritious. And don't forget locally sourced. Okay, now I'm really looking forward to a Florida dairy summer. Bueno, in that case, visit floridamilk.com or lechedeflorida.com today for info on the benefits of dairy and more ways to enjoy dairy all year long. Also, don't forget to look for the number 12 under the sale by date on your gallon of milk. If it starts with a 12, it's Florida milk. This is DJ. And this is Ish. And this is season, season six, six of, of Better, Better Let, Let Me, Me Tell You. you. So today we have with us one of our favorite guests. Um, I mean, you know, we had a little bit of a snafu starting, but we managed to get this going. <laughs> Finally, we managed to get this going. And I mean, with all apologies to to, to Wolf uh, Blitzer, he is the best eyebrows <laughs> on CNN. We have with us <laughs> Boris Sanchez. Thank you for joining us again, man. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be with you guys, Ish and DJ. So much has happened since the last time we sat down to do one of these. It was like autumn of 2019 and i think like that's two crazy. months after we talked the world melted down yeah <laughs> that's a, yeah about like the equivalent of 50 years have passed you know um, <laughs> yeah. an election a pandemic you know an interaction a you know things. just a few things <laughs> little, little blips here and there yeah, yeah how are the, you guys but on the plus side we we got to hang out a little bit at 305 day Yes. So, yeah, you know, and, it wasn't all was bad a, doom and gloom. Yeah, there was another event that, that we connected at, too, that I, I was uh, yes. covering as a reporter. Yes, so, uh, yeah, Lin Manuel, that, that yeah. Doom and gloom. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, again, thank you, because I know you're, you're, you're really busy, obviously, you know. But oh, now, as busy as you are, you're finally on, like, a normal schedule with CNN. You're not doing the early, early morning having to madrugar, right? Like, you're, you're about to start the, the new daytime programming on CNN. Yes, about as normal as a news schedule will allow. So we're <laughs> on from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern in the afternoons, weekdays. Uh, we premiered on Monday, so I'm super excited about it. And yeah, I actually get to have a social life now. I don't have to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning on Saturdays and Sundays, Oof. which is, is it's open all sorts of doors, you know? <laughs> <laughs> he's realizing that bars are open late now mm. it's it's a whole thing 100%. so I, I i always lo love to hear like people that work the morning shift like I, I hear this a lot in like other you know whatever news station that people that do the the, the morning show they're always like oh my god we got to wake up at three in the morning so like really you would have to wake up that early to to be in in, in the office by whatever time i would wake i had the alarm set for 3 12 a.m because there was a conference call at 3.15 that I had to be on, and I would take the call on my chest. Like, I would put it right here and be kind of mostly awake for it and <laughs> contributing what I could. But, uh, but yeah, so that I took that call at that time, and then I was in the studio uh, pretty close to 4. Like, the latest I ever got in was, like, 4.30. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's your personal hell, DJ. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. Like, I, He's I not a morning person I, at all. I don't. So at all. His, yeah. It's funny because I, I tried all my life to be a morning person because you know those people that like when you like drag into the office at 9, 9 30 and they're like, I've already cleaned the house, gone to the gym, gone grocery shopping, and I made it to work on time. And I'm like, oh my God, shut up. When, by the time <laughs> I turned 30, I was like, you know, I'm not a morning person. F the morning person. Like, <laughs> But when when you do that job that you know that schedule that you had you have no choice like you have to be a morning person, and, and the reality is like you have to be plugged in all the time. So when I say like joke like this is as normal as a news schedule can get, it's because like right now there are emails going around about the latest news, which is that next week we anticipate President Biden is going to announce he's running for reelection, mm -hmm. and the thing is like. If I'm not plugged into the latest details on that, when new detail new details trickle in, uh, there's just more to catch up on. So you're you're constantly kind of absorbing information bit by bit, so that if you 
need to be able to talk about it in an instant, you can. Mm -hmm. So like yesterday we had uh, the Supreme Court staying this decision on mifepristone, the most commonly used abortion drug. And as I was talking to a reporter about it in the air, she was handed a piece of paper that the Supreme Court had made this decision. And so at that moment, if you're not up to date with what everything that that means and, and the implications legally and practically for women all over the country, then you're not able to have a, a thorough conversation about it. So it truly is a, a 24 seven endeavor. Right. Um, but I, I'm addicted to it. There's, you know, I love this job. <laughs> you're in the right field then. <laughs> so, so, you, you know, from, from the previous, you know, the previous shows and times that you were on CNN to now this one through four o'clock, um, time schedule tell us a little bit of the aside from the time a little bit of the difference of like what the newscast or show before and what you're going to be doing now or what you're doing now so this is a complete deconstruction of the traditional news format uh we don't have an anchor desk and it's three anchors and we're constantly moving we have enormous like the the walls in our studio go completely around and it's it's called cnn news central in part because it's we're at the center of all the news being around us um and so there are enormous graphics flying by us there's like a steady cam operator constantly running around um it, it relies a lot more on reporters and specific experts in their field than it does talking heads so instead of a thank god Agreed. Uh, instead of a, a cookie cutter, uh, Walter Cronkite behind a microphone, behind a desk, you know, this uh, voice from on high, it's a conversation between three people that have uh, expertise in various fields, uh, very captivating personal stories, and then uh, the news sort of flies around us and we present it as it comes Um in a way that's just as accessible and as conversational as possible. That's an interesting approach. And, and, I, and I know you and I were kind of like chatting back and forth. You know, you, you just, you know, you, while we were talking, you're like, you know, I live and breathe this. I mainline it. But I, <laughs> but I will say I, I do feel from a personal critique, and I think this might be what, what the new show is trying to, to change, that there's just too much news. Like everything is just, we're constantly being bombarded with it. And, you know, my, my favorite, my favorite joke to myself is like, everything now is breaking news, breaking news, mm. breaking news, breaking news, breaking news. And like, if everything's breaking, then nothing is breaking, right? Like it's one of those, if everything is important, then how do I really, how do I get in there and, and know what's really important, right? Like what's the, 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 the clickbait versus the actual information versus, you know, the, the, the detail that's still being figured out. And, is that really kind of the goal of, of, of what you guys are doing right now, which is trying to sift through everything to, to parse it all out? I think so. Um, I, it made news that we have new leadership at CNN. It's been a year now under a, a new vision. And one of the first things that uh, our boss, Chris Lick, did was scale back how often we presented things as breaking news, in part because there is a boy who cried wolf effect right where if everything is the most urgent the most important thing you've heard then nothing is so you really have to calibrate and and there are standards now when something is actually breaking news and there are other ways to present things that are urgent and happening now but that aren't necessarily undoing the news cycle which right. is what the phrase breaking news means right um and i think that that engenders trust in the viewer because then they have a better understanding of uh, when something actually breaks, when something is actually vital to your understanding of the politics or the culture, et cetera, et cetera, then that draws a distinction from just the constant bombardment. And I think one of the negative aspects to what you're describing, that dynamic, is that people then tune out. Um, and, and it works multiple ways. I think part of it is that there is a preponderance of news and news outlets out there. And I have friends, for example, that often say, Boris, I like you. We've been friends forever. I don't necessarily like or trust CNN. I don't necessarily like or trust mainstream media because I, I always feel like there's an agenda. And most often those folks tune out 
And those are the exact people that then find themselves vulnerable to not only fake information, but people that are out to take advantage, right? And they get swindled of their time and their money in a myriad of ways. And it's sad that that's kind of one of the things that we have to fight. Yeah. You know, when you were talking a little bit earlier about the format of the show, I was, I don't know why, I'm going to bring it back to Miami here, why... I was thinking about back in the early 90s when WSVN7 uh, premiered the Newsplex. The Newsplex, yes. <laughs> it was such a big deal. Actually, that I was I like, do, yeah. it's two floors. Like, it's two it's floors. all around like, us. It's that's around the us. vision that yeah. I got. But um, but going with that, with that new format, um, you know, one of the things that, as Ish said, that sometimes with, with not just CNN, just in general, is that you would talk about something – or about a certain news story, and there will be seven talking heads chiming in. And a lot of times, you know, it's a little bit overwhelming because you have seven different people saying seven different things about the same thing, and they're all different but the same. And, you know, I think that leads to a little bit of editorializing what you're talking about. Is this new format, is one of the purposes just that, to just have the news straightforward? This is what the news are, this is what's going on, and, you know, obviously the, the viewer takes it. I think that there is undoubtedly a place for debate and that is a specific type of show format that is beneficial to the political discourse, to the democracy, et cetera, to hear different viewpoints and to have people go back and forth. I think while it makes occasionally for very exciting TV, it's not necessarily a format that leans into just providing the viewer with raw information for them to make their own decisions. And I think what frequently happened um, across media was that people relied on the debate to gather information. And the debate isn't necessarily the place to find those nuggets that allow you to make an informed decision. It's not the place to delve into the context of a story the way that we're trying to do. So instead of going into, okay, we have these two or three different points of view, let's have a forum where we can have that argument. We are more focused on at those hours from 1 through 4 p.m., presenting the viewer just with information, just straight reporting, go to an expert on mental health, for example, a guest that I had on today about uh, Senator John Fetterman, or uh, a conversation with a Supreme Court analyst who can break down some of the latest details in their decisions, or uh, someone who can talk about ultra marathon running and that uh, woman <laughs> in Great Britain that like stepped into a car and like spent a chunk of the race uh, driving around and then won third place and held up the medal like she actually did something. Wow! Um, wow! It, yeah, they got it, just, just, right? <laughs> yeah, like, they got out. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, just having those kinds of uh, conversations with experts and reporters uh, allows you to go deeper into the information. We have more time to actually talk about the facts and the pertinent details and kind of pushing to the side, at least during our hours, those more sort of debate type of uh, arguments and presentation. So something I really wanted to ask you, because um, as you said, you know, it's been a, it's been a few years uh, that uh, you were on the show. Something I really wanted to touch base with you as a media professional um, and as a Latino is the misinformation among specifically the Latin community. I mean, I'm sure there's misinformation among all communities, but it seems this is that our the, community, the so Latin let's talk about community it. <laughs> is just, it's targeted, it's drowning in misinformation just over and over and over again. What do you think is what do you think is the root of this and why is it the Latino community specifically, I feel, is being targeted um, or appears to be susceptible to right to to this like such vast misinformation? Well, uh, yeah, 
<laughs> well, no, I mean, you know, you're, we're friends and all, but te tenemos que poner duro every once in a while, you know? Like, <laughs> Wendy Williams or something. Bueno, we could. Uh, Listen, I want to know el arreglo que le mandaste. No, no, I don't I know. Think, like, <laughs> I, I think, look, there, there are so many layers to this issue. Uh, I focus some of my reporting leading up to the midterm election specifically on Latino voters and specifically on the issue of misinformation. And there is, I think, a genuine debate about how persuasive that kind of misinformation is uh, and also uh, how pervasive it is. Uh, because a lot of times folks will point to like Radio Mambi and be like, oh my God, all the shit that they're talking on Radio Mambi and like all these crazy things. But then if you look at the ratings, like nobody really listens to Radio Mambi by the numbers in, in a way that would swing an election, right? Okay. So, so, so I think there there is a a an important and nuanced debate about whether that misinformation actually trickles through. I think it's undoubtable that some of the stuff that reaches uh, our families and our loved ones uh, is dangerous. You know, I, I talked to several young people who told me that they had a difficult time exchanging with their parents in the lead up to the election because they believed things like. The Joe Biden we see is a clone. He's not actually the president. Mm -hmm. COVID is not real. The vaccines will do X, Y, and Z to you. This is all, you know, a ploy. And that is false and dangerous and damaging not only to an individual's health, but to their family and, and their ability uh, to, you know, uh, exchange with their grandparents, for example. I will say that I think part of the reason that our community is susceptible to certain kinds of misinformation is because, and I'm speaking specifically about Cubans, uh, there is a lot of generational trauma. Yes, right? of course. And that often is exploited. And there is a sensitivity to a certain type of political argument and certain keywords and calling somebody un comunista is, you know, that is high treason in Miami, right? I'm sitting next to a guy who gets it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, for sure. And, and I'm sure you get it for just like very middle of the road opinions that you have yeah. in the yeah. context of the United States, right? I work I work in politics and I work in obviously for, I've worked for the Democratic Party um, during elections and all that. And it's, you know, it's sort of like, I mean, I don't want to say it's going to battle like, a, like a, a soldier, but you have to be sort of mentally and emotionally prepared because I remember when I started getting that, that I was being called a communist all day, you know, there comes a point that it, it really starts to bother you because it's like, you know, this, as you said, that's, that's like high treason within our community. And like, you're calling me a communist because you just don't agree with my political views. Like, and, and, and it comes to a point that it really does offend you. And like, you, you do take it in, but I mean, obviously you have to put it aside and keep moving forward. But but that's not an easy thing to do because, you know, we either personally had experiences with that kind of authoritarianism or our parents did. And so for us, that's that's painful and, and offensive. And look, it, it carries it carries weight. How could you not feel like you're being called the worst thing you could be called? Right. Um, and, and I think. It, it's a difficult balance because at the same time, you have to consider that that pain comes from something very real. You know, when when I talk to folks who have those beliefs and they, you know, they they maybe throw barbs at me for working for CNN, uh, even though I, I think we are very fair and, and we present both sides of things, they have very different uh, views. And when I talk to them and, and especially the older folks that have been through a lot and they they sort of throw those barbs at me, I remember like there possibly was a point in this person's life where someone came to their front door and told them, Doito me, right? Or or something to that effect. Like everything that you've ever worked for your entire life now belongs to the government. And they got beat up in the street because they said something uh, between friends, you know, over drinks late at night. Yeah, it's not about you. Or, right. It, exactly. It, it comes from a place of tremendous trauma and insecurity. And what I try to do is take a deep breath 
and try to to honor that pain will simultaneously say that's not really a fair historical comparison to what we're dealing with now and you should consider perhaps the way that history may have affected your thinking about what we're experiencing now right right and for anybody who questions you know boris's bona fides he's got havana posters right there in the background so you know it's, <laughs> he's where he I wears mean, his cuban pride like dude, loud and proud I, 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 I'm, I'm, that's the thing. When, whenever people say that, I'm like, look, my, my grandfather was a political prisoner. He was incarcerated, sentenced to 20 years fighting communism. So don't, don't come to me with that because since I was a jit, that message of democracy and freedom and right. fighting authoritarianism and anything that even smells like authoritarianism, that shit is in my bones. That's why I do what I do. It's generational trauma. It like it really, it, it really is handed down to the next generation, and it's 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 hard. It's hard to deal with. It it really, really is because you know we didn't live through that. I mean, I was born in Cuba, but I, I came when I was a year old. Uh, we didn't live through that personally, but our family and and like you know your grandfather did, and those are things that stay with you for for forever. You know they they don't they don't go away, and they shape you who you are. So. Um, yeah, it, it's such a the the Cuban issue is such a complex, multi layered <laughs> situation. And and I, and I'll say, I mean, just on the topic, you know, of misinformation, it's just amazing to me how quickly it can just kind of get out of hand. You know, like it's uh, I, again, you know, you and I were chatting earlier about, you know, the you, you mentioned Wendy Williams, so I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of, <laughs> you know, there was that rumor that was started about, you know, that Wendy Williams. Don't know, and, yeah, Wendy. Okay, you know, yeah. like there was this whole my thing, soulmate. Your soulmate. I mean, I could see it honestly. I could see it. I could see you holding her up as the Statue of Liberty, um, you know, right before she went down. I I see it happening. Boris, how you doing? <laughs> but exactly. I could see it. I could see it. But again, it's just that thing of like, and I even told you I was like, oye, me da un poco de pena because I had seen that story too and i was kind of like oh i didn't know he was married you know what i mean and i like and yet and I'm, i just love the fact that it became this whole narrative out of out of nothingness you know and yet boom but, it hit the ground but running that that sort of silly personal thing that is truly of no right actual consequence it serves as a perfect example of how misinformation spreads because it starts with one minor thing, right? One either misperception uh, that is unintentionally harmful or someone deliberately trying to cause harm. Right. And it's thrown into the ether. I have no idea how the thing that I was married started. I don't know. Somewhere on the internet, it must have been somewhere because um, Wendy, as lovely as she is, uh, talked about me on her show and one of her producers, I guess, Googled me and said, no, Wendy, he's married. And then she said it. So what we find in the news industry and, and across media, especially social media, is that uh, there's aggregation. So somebody says, yep. uh, this happened here and they state it as fact. And so Wendy states as fact on her show that I'm married and it gets picked up by tabloids. And suddenly if you Googled me, it says that I'm married to a woman that I have never met, that I, I, I've i never been it's married. It's not even an I've ex. Never, no, I've never been married. I've never been engaged. I've never asked anybody to marry me, right? And I, they, this, the, a number of tabloids took images from my Instagram of me with my ex-girlfriend and published it as if I was married to this random woman that I'm sure is lovely that lives in California who's married to a guy named Boris Sanchez. Uh, <laughs> that is not me, again. That's not me. But when, you know, my ex-girlfriend saw it, she thought it was hilarious. But then when we broke up and I started dating again, all these women that I was meeting oh, would Google me and then be like, oh, this guy's a scumbag. <laughs> yeah. This guy is Claro que sí. You know, he he was married, he was married and having an affair with Wendy Williams. I right. mean, <laughs> I mean, come on. Come yeah. on. So so again, this is like not of of major importance. This is not consequential, which is why like I never felt the need to be like, uh, you know, but when you break it down, uh, those publications that put that stuff out there, they never reached out to me to confirm anything. Right. 
And people are just consuming this information, believing what they read on the internet yeah, without if verification. Out, they if they had reached out, they'd have no story. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, let's face yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, th- I, think it's, I, I think it's mostly just carelessness when you see stuff like that. But then imagine, now transpose what you just heard. Oh, yeah. Either someone deliberately spreading something that is false, trying to harm either a person or a group of people or an institution, and then it starts getting repeated. And repeated We've seen and repeated many times recently and, and broadcast times. and it becomes an avalanche and suddenly you're dealing not with, you know, some silly thing about right. who, who some random uh, journalist is married to, but you're dealing with, oh, hey, the election was stolen. Right. 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 Or vaccines cause. Yeah. 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 You can put a magnet. Give you give you enlarged but, testicles because of yeah. Nicki Minaj's cousin. Yeah. Right. Um, right. Right. And, and, and just to, to be, uh, to be clear, for both of those messages, there is a very receptive audience, right? So I, I feel like there's, you know, I'm I'm chatting with you guys to promote what we do at CNN and to promote our show, but really the message that I want to get out there to the world, uh, I feel like a, a lot of people are missing out on quality mm-hmm. journalism. And if you are like me, you're a curious person, you want to know how the world works, you want to have quality information, you have to cut through the BS, right? Yeah. And you you need to ask yourself, what is it that I want to be true, right? Uh, information, uh, consuming information is much like consuming food. If you are constantly going for junk, it is going to affect your health, inevitably. Yeah. And so have a more balanced news diet Look for the things that you don't want to be true. Right? That's actually challenge, what I do a lot of times. Yeah. Cha- that, that's the best way to challenge I, I, yourself. It's, yeah. the, it's the best way to test ideas. Yeah. I always say the, the beauty of uh, many times on the show, the beauty of the internet is that it gave everybody a voice. The bad thing about the internet is that it gave, gave everybody, everybody a voice. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like, exactly. so you got to take the good with the exactly. bad. Exactly. How, you know, spe- you know, further speaking about this, how does, you know, a major news organization like CNN, how do you address, you know, I'm sure this is, you know, meetings and meetings they've had and throughout the last few years about this. How do you address, how do you even begin to, um, you know, answer that question that we say so much about social media and, and whether Cutting it's through. people reposting things on Facebook or reading stuff on Facebook or whatever. How, how does a major news source even compete with that um, because I, I can't even begin to imagine how how you you even go about that. A compete in what sense? In in your your credible news organization with journalists, right. kind of like what you were saying. With you know, you know the, the vetting. Are, I'm sure that. there's a vetting process to it compared mm. to oh, yeah. you know that I, I forgot what's the number of percentage of people that get their their news from Facebook. Yeah, I mean, it, it's difficult. I, I would say that, and I'm speaking very broadly, I think that we aren't necessarily going after the same audience. So I think that, you know, we, just across the board, I think the the quality of your work and your reputation will draw eyeballs, right? I think that that's the reason why on election nights, when there are huge national and international events, uh, CNN has established itself as a brand that the world can rely on. And consistently, you see that Absolutely. in ratings, whether it's January 6th or, or whatever it is. But in terms of what is good for the democracy and the world, um, it's, it's sort of kind of the dynamic that Ish touched on, you know, we, one of the blessings of a democracy is that people are free, individuals are free to live as they wish and consume what they wish to a degree and operate in the world, navigate the world as they wish. And that is also very problematic when you have a disruptive technology like the internet that allows people to live siloed and not only siloed, but to then be, uh, allowed or or incentivized to consume stuff that keeps getting more and more distant from reality because these social media networks their algorithms are designed 
so that if you decide, you know, I want to search for, uh, yeah, if you're a flat earther picture, no, I, I want to search for a picture of JFK. I like the, you know, the glasses and the Northeastern yacht lifestyle, right? You search for JFK, I guarantee you one of the posts you're going to find will have to do with the conspiracy behind his assassination. And if just out of curiosity, you open up, you know, so, uh, stills from the Zapruder film or you look up Lee Harvey Oswald, that algorithm <laughs> is going to go nuts because it's going to take you to the Earth is flat. It's going to take you to QAnon. It's going to take you to the juiciest, most extreme version of whatever simple thing you decided to look for was it is a machine that radicalizes and one of the things that i think we have to remember is that social media is a machine that runs on some of our biggest weaknesses as humans i mean we're, we're all human and we all have our, our failings it preys on our envy it preys on our insecurities and if you want good mental health generally I would say that you you have to regulate what it is that you're consuming on social media the same way you have to regulate what it is you're consuming with general information and and just and you know you don't stick your head in an oven if you want to be healthy right mm -hmm. so maybe put the phone down for a little while and don't focus on somebody yelling about how the world is coming to an end yeah yeah, as a rule, I think that's a good. And that would be Twitter. Just, just, yeah, exactly. Stay off Twitter is what Boris is saying. You know, without saying know, it, like, yeah. And, and, you know, it's funny. I, 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 I have a strong aversion to like people, uh, you know, uh, speaking from on high and and calling for uh, groups of people to change their behavior because it's the right thing to do. Moralizing and, and proselytizing and that sort of. Thing. I have a general aversion to it. But what I would humbly present to your listeners is that you will feel a lot healthier if you manage the consumption of information better. And and again, I, I genuinely feel that so many people are missing out on some of the most exciting events happening in the world because they don't know where to find good journalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think we can answer that question for them. They can find good journalism Monday through Friday from one to four <laughs> on CNN with our boy Boris. Uh, you Listen, know, it's. I, I would be flattered if if your listeners were to tune in. I, but again, I, I would stress it's it's about having balance. Right. So whatever it is that you, if you're honest with yourself and you're like, man, I really don't like this and news that makes that look bad excites you and you feel a certain way about it just give it a chance for a day or for an hour or for five minutes go and look at the opposite of whatever that is because we as humans again going back to just natural tendencies we're going to go back to the things that make us feel good and what makes us feel good things that reinforce what we believe about the world but sometimes you wind up believing that you're married to somebody you've never met in your entire <laughs> life because you read it on some tablet. And it, it's actually a complete fabrication based on nothing that's real. It, we, we carry beliefs that are often uh, faulty. And so I'm just saying, I think it's good for everybody to take a deep breath, step back and reanalyze those beliefs. Yeah. And and just, just for our listeners, we are actually, when this is done, going to reach out to Wendy Williams for comment. Good because with that. Because, uh, you know, <laughs> we have to, we have to confirm our sources. To we have yeah, to yeah, confirm yeah. our sources. That's what Boris wants I, us to do. I, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> sure what Wendy's up to again. I think she's lovely. And she said so many flattering things about me. So I very much appreciate them. I did send her flowers because uh, I was, because I was you were raised warned right. by what she said. Because you were What's raised that? right. That's why you sent her flowers. Because you were raised <laughs> by a yeah. Cuban mother. It, 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 That's it, it, why. Yeah. Yeah. Who knew one of the Yeah. 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 Like, as my, as my no, dad says, no. when, I, when I've shown him, you know, uh, Boris, I'm seeing, he goes, I say Cubanito. And I'm like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But I will say, you have just opened a can of worms, the rivalry between... Lo Wechetero and Lo de Hialeah. Oh, that's La right. Gente propria. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. I forgot. I forgot. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to start like a whole West Side Story, no, you know. No, no, no. no. Turf War. <laughs> 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 oh, oh yeah, Boris. I know you got to go, but legit, man. It's always great chatting with you. It's you know we we say this all the time. You know, part of the one of the things we didn't expect when we started this podcast is meeting people that we would actually you know 
like and keep a you know a, oh. a, a friendship and relationship with and you know what we're, we're glad you're one of them it, you're you're just a genuine person you you make us proud yeah i mean oh, honestly that's very kind you really, yeah, really that's do. very kind i mean uh aside from sort of what i what i alluded to before with uh with my grandfather and my parents and uh everything that they endured to provide for my sister and i and our family and, and my sincere belief that uh the american dream is real and alive and that we should sacrifice to keep democracy alive uh making my community uh, proud of me and and representing people that are underrepresented, right? I mean, yeah. there's not a lot of voices that come from our community uh, that have a platform. I've been blessed to have earned one, and I've been very lucky uh, in my career to to have been given this opportunity by CNN. So there's no way that I'm going to take this for granted. Yeah, bueno, always awesome talking to you, man. Un abrazo from from both of us and. I mean, listen, let's not let three years go by. Be, next time you're, you're, you're in Miami, Miami next time. Let, let us know. We'll, we'll give you chicken wings. We'll That's give right. you, you gotta, you gotta we'll come try the wings. Oh, oh, chicken wings. You gotta come try the wings. I would love that. And and uh, I appreciate the worm from you guys. As you know, I, I love listening. And so uh, I look forward to getting together next time. All right. Cuídate. Thank you guys so much. Hasta luego. Pero Let Me Tell You is co-hosted by Darian Borges and Ismael Llano, produced by Ismael Llano, and our theme, Pero Let Me Tell You Freestyle, is composed by Michael Angelo Lomlaplex, the official gay guy. And don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes. <laughs>